Uh, we now uh, move to questions to the Minister of Social Development, and of course we'll start with all questions. And question number four has been uh, withdrawn. Robin McGann. Not in her place. Um, let us move on. Uh, Gordon Dunn. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question, question number two, please. Thank the member for his question and say that my department is fully committed to the development and regeneration of Bangor Town Centre. In July 2011, I published the Bangor Town Centre Master Plan, which set out a range of proposals for the regeneration of the town centre, including a major development scheme for the Queen's Parade area that the plan identified as the optimum way to regenerate the town centre. In March 2013, I gave my department approval to purchase land holdings at Queen's Parade Bangor when the previous private sector plans stalled. In the interest of the better planning of Bangor, my department are taking the lead in progressing proposals for a major comprehensive development scheme which was endorsed in the Bangor Master Plan. Schemes of this size and ambition are complex and challenging to deliver, and my department has established a project board to oversee the comprehensive development of the scheme and attain uh, of, the, of the site and attain planning approval for the development. In recent months, my department has purchased a number of additional properties required to complete the proposed site boundary, and negotiations are ongoing with the remaining property owners. The procurement process to appoint a team of consultants to take forward a planning application for Queen's Parade was also finalised in March. Turning Associates, the successful team, will work with my officials to carry out some early engagement events to seek the views of the public, local businesses and council on what they would like to see developed on this site. In taking forward development plans, my department is committed to ensuring that there is effective communication with and involvement of the local community and all key stakeholders. Previous development proposals have been set aside, and we are starting with a blank sheet in terms of what the site will look like. This is a major regeneration project, and it will take 12 months to assemble all the land needed and attain planning approval. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers. I'd also like to put on record our thanks to the Minister for his interest in the Bangor Seafront and, in fact, in DSD their input into the public realm in Bangor and Hollywood, which is to start shortly. Further, on, further to that, can the Minister advise on timescales and give us an assurance today that we are not just going round on a, another roundabout, a picky, but we are making real progress and that, that DSD will be able to influence, really influence outcomes on Bangor Seafront? Um. A number of uh, key steps now need to be taken, and the first of these is to assemble the site. My department has already agreed purchases for four of the 12 properties needed uh, by mutual consent, and discussions with the remaining property owners within the proposed site boundary are ongoing. Turney Associates, a leading planning team, were appointed in March 14 to attain planning approval by March 15 for the Queen's Parade site. Um, the member will be aware that responsibility for regeneration will transfer to Council under the reform of local government in April 2015. So at that point, Council will therefore become responsible for taking the next step to bring on board a contractor to construct the scheme in line with the planning approval. If all progresses smoothly, construction would therefore commence on the site in the year 2017-2018. This is a major development. There is obviously a timeline for construction work to start, but I can assure the member that I am fully committed to seeing the redevelopment of that prestigious site, a very important site, on the seafront, and I am sure that the Council, when they inherit uh, this piece of work, will be equally committed to that. I know that to be the case. Uh, Stephen Agnew. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I also thank the Minister for his and the Department's interest in Bangor Seafront. Could I ask the Minister what work his department is doing to ensure that community input goes beyond passive consultation but includes active uh, community participation? Um, yes, I, I can assure the member in that regard because my department has established a community engagement consultation group. And that comprises representatives from the Harbour Ward Community Association, so people in the area, the Group for a Better Bangor FAB, Town Centre Management, the Chamber of Commerce and North Downborough Council. So that 
Community Engagement Consultation Group will be working closely with Turley Associates to develop viable proposals for the site. It's important that we get the best input, the maximum input from as many stakeholders as possible so that the wisdom, the insights, the ideas that people have are there and are fed into the process. And uh, I hope the member will be reassured by that process. Katrina Rath. Question number three, please. During my term in office, I have taken significant steps to meet need across all housing tenures, and I responded to the challenging economic situation with the first ever housing strategy for Northern Ireland. As part of that strategy, I am committed to increasing the supply of affordable housing. In conjunction with private finance resources, funding from my department has allowed co-ownership to support the purchase of around 2,800 affordable homes over the last three years. And that has helped meet the aspirations of those seeking to be homeowners but who cannot do so without the assistance of the co-ownership scheme. And that allows applicants to purchase a home without taking out a mortgage for the full purchase price at the beginning and allows them to buy as large a share as they can do to start with. The funding allocated to the Northern Ireland Co-Ownership Housing Association was in 2011-12 28.25 million, 12, 13, 33 million, and 13, 14, 50 million. There are real benefits from providing affordable homes through co ownership. Firstly, they cost the government nothing in maintenance because, unlike social homes, maintenance costs fall to the applicant which, uh, who purchases a home under the scheme. And secondly, it allows my department to utilise its budget better to support more households. Thirdly, in assisting people to buy their own home, the scheme prevents those who wish to purchase their own home but cannot do so outright from having to apply to the social housing waiting list to have their housing needs met. It therefore helps to shorten the housing waiting list. Co-ownership also benefits the Northern Ireland economy, as around 50% of homes purchased through the scheme are new builds. And the local economic multiplier effect means that for every 10 jobs created or sustained um, in the construction industry through housing projects, there are further seven jobs sustained in other areas of the economy. I'd like to thank the Minister for his response. And I wonder would the Minister update us on what additional funding has been allocated in co-ownership housing from monitoring rounds during this mandate? Um, I don't have those uh, precise figures to hand, but I'm sure uh, the member will be well aware of them, and I would be um, having researched the matter before asking the question, uh, and I'm happy to, to supply the precise figures. But it's important uh, that where um, there is money that cannot be spent in a particular area, we seek to have that transferred across and used profitably, rather than seeing it drawn off, perhaps even towards the end of a year, going back to the Treasury. Um, and again, in terms of housing provision, I think it's important for the member to grasp also that we shouldn't see these different tenures as totally unconnected. Because as I pointed out in my initial answer there, if there's someone who might be going into a social home because they're not in a position to start the purchase of their own home, and we're able to assist them by co-ownership to start the purchase of their own home, then indeed we free up a social house for another family. So it's a matter of looking at housing provision across all tenures because all of them help to meet and address the need. But I will provide the detailed figures to, to the member. Uh, Gregory Campbell. Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Minister has outlined the benefit of, of co ownership. Can I indicate the change that there has been since coming into office in the intervening years uh, of that benefit of co ownership between then and now? Um, Yes, the, the member makes an important point there just about the scale of the provision, and it, it is hugely beneficial in terms of meeting housing need um, over the period. Um, the, the number of co-ownership purchases in the last three years are as follows. In the year 11-12, there were 643 houses. In 12-13, 957 houses. And in the year 13-14, we're on track to deliver 1,200 house purchases by March, uh, by in fact, today being the last day of March. Uh, the number of social homes delivered in the same period as follows, 11, 12, 14, uh, 110, uh, 12, 13, 1379, and 13, uh, 14, 1275. The other great benefit that comes to this is the benefit for the construction sector and job creation and the knock-on effect uh, because of the multiplier uh, effect uh, that there is with construction jobs. 
And, and finally, there, in terms of, of co-ownership and social homes, uh, the big challenge now is to work with the housing association sector to increase the number of social homes that are provided, deal with the blockages, and facilitate the expansion of the housing association sector to, to deliver more homes. Uh, Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm grateful to the Minister uh, for his response so far, but Minister, how can you ensure that you get the balance right? Given the high level of demand for social housing and the fact today that more people are currently living now in private rent than there are living within the social housing sector, so how do you ensure that you get the balance right? Well, again, I, I make the same point to the member as, uh, as I did to, to, to Mr. Allen there. I think the key to this is to understand that housing provision has to be seen right across the board. There's nothing wrong with living in a private rented house. Somehow or another, it's almost stigmatized by some political parties. Whereas uh, in Great Britain and elsewhere across Europe, it is quite a, a, a major element of, of housing tenure. What we need to do with the private rented sector is to do something that I'm already doing, and that is to see um, more monitoring, registration, regulation, legislation in place to make sure that it is fit for purpose. And of course, that's something that I have taken forward already with landlord registration, tenancy deposit schemes, etc. So that's important because this is always going to be a major element of uh, the, the housing provision in Northern Ireland, it's a significant element. Um, in terms of the social housing development programme, uh, as I've indicated already in my answer to, to Mr. Campbell there, we need to work closely with the housing associations to find out what are the blockages now that are preventing them delivering more. There was a period some years ago where it was very simple for them. They just bought off the shelf because the housing market was such as it was. There were a lot of houses sitting about. That has largely been soaked up. That was why it was possible to deliver more at a particular point in time some years ago. But now that has largely been mopped up. We're now in a position where the focus has to be much more on new build, and we need to work with the housing associations to get the, the um, blockages that are there. And, and I may well return to that later on in this uh, session, but that's something that uh, we're working closely with them to tackle. Uh, John Dallet. Uh, question number five, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> uh, well, uh, I launched the first scheme under the Affordable Home Loans Fund on the 20th of March this year, uh, which happened to be a Clan Mill scheme um, in Lisburn. Other schemes will be coming online over the next few months, and I would hope that they will have as wide a geographical spread as possible across Northern Ireland, remembering, of course, that affordable housing is necessarily a demand-led undertaking. Early proposed schemes are in East Belfast and North Belfast, as well as the scheme I launched recently in Lisburn. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the uh, Minister for his answer. In deciding the locations for affordable housing, is the Minister mindful of the history of this place, where in the past housing was decided on the potential votes rather than the needs of the people? Well, I think that it would be helpful if the member understood better what the Affordable Home Loans Fund is about. And I, I stated there in my uh, initial answer that this is necessarily a demand-led undertaking. I don't say to a housing association, you have to build there, you have to build there, you have to build somewhere else. They look at what is available and they make their decision as to whether they can make a scheme stack up. They have access to £19 million uh, over the next number of years. Um, there are uh, a number of associations in Northern Ireland that have uh, been able to bid successfully. I wish there had been more, but there were a number that were able to, build, uh, or to bid successfully. And I want to congratulate them on their initiative in coming up with good schemes which did stack up. But ultimately, it will be their decision as to the areas where uh, housing is provided. And so in the case of Lisburn, it was a simple choice for them very much for Clamill because there were houses there which they're able to bring back into use. What would have been otherwise empty homes brought back into use. Um, and um, I'm point very clearly, as I did uh, on a number of occasions, um, in all of these matters, I will stand over my record in terms of being fair and equitable in all of these things. Um, I want to address some of the um, inequities of the past and will continue to do that. So, for example, in regard to the maintenance of housing executive properties. But in all of these things, 
If the member understands the scheme properly, it's up to the housing associations themselves. Lord Morrow. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the Minister has to some degree answered uh, my supplementary question, but could I ask him just in relation to, I feel there's not enough detail is available uh, on the Affordable Home Loans Fund. Could the Minister elaborate on it? But please. Happy to do that, and indeed I hope that Mr. Dallet will find that helpful in increasing his understanding of the scheme. The fund is the local application of the Get Britain Building Scheme, um, which was set up by the United Kingdom Government to increase housing supply and support the construction industry. Three local housing associations were successful, and they bid for a total of £19 million from the fund, and those are Apex, Clan Mill, and Oakley. All submitted exciting and innovative proposals that will increase the supply of affordable homes in Northern Ireland as well as bringing empty homes back into use. And that's an important thing as well because um, there are far too many empty homes, since many that have been left lying around for far too long. These exciting and innovative proposals are different to the existing co-ownership model in that rather than purchasers selecting a property and then applying to co-ownership for support, the housing association involved will develop specific housing schemes with associated shared equity finance available. While complementary to the existing co-ownership scheme, these affordable home loan uh, schemes offer the first shared equity alternatives to it. And the proposals from Apex, Clan Mill and Oakley offer a mix of new build with all the associated benefits for the construction sector and the refurbishment of empty homes, which also creates work for the construction sector and will bring vacant properties back from disrepair into much-needed and valued family homes. Over the next six years, the fund will deliver up to 600 affordable homes across the province, and that means up to 600 more families in Northern Ireland will be able to take that first important step onto the property ladder. And I'm sure all members from all parties will welcome that. Leslie Cree. Question six, Mr. Speaker. The piloting of universal credit in Great Britain, commonly referred to as a pathfinder or more recently as the Universal Credit Live Service by the Department for Work and Pensions, has been designed to test the ICT system, the claimant experience and to inform the ongoing development of processes and systems before further expansion. Whilst my officials are engaged at a number of levels with the Department for Work and Pensions, to ensure that Northern Ireland is aware of progress with the ongoing development of the system. I'm not in a position to provide an assessment of the live service, as the Department for Work and Pensions, their own evaluation is still ongoing, and to date has been based on a limited number of potential claimants. Currently, this group is limited to claimants who are under 25 years of age, with no housing costs or children. Now, plans are in place to expand this group to couples and families during 2014, and that will allow the supporting IT to be further developed and tested. The outworking of this approach that is being taken by DWP and the lessons learned from live running will inform decisions as to when the system will actually go live in Northern Ireland. Well, I thank the Minister for his response. I'll be, there was, I was hoping for a lot more detail uh, uh, obviously it's early days yet. Yeah, does the Minister have any detail uh, at all of, for example, the number of single men, the, the size of the samples or any of that sort of thing which would be useful to Northern Ireland? Well, all I can do is reiterate for the member the point which I've already made and it's a very important one. I'm not in a position to provide an assessment of this because the Department for Work and Pensions, and they're the folk whose scheme it is and who are taking it forward. They're the folk who have commissioned and who are developing the ICT system. They have not yet carried out or completed their evaluation. It's an ongoing thing. Um, and it's ongoing on the basis that as different uh, categories of claimant come in, um, the process will be an iterative one. It's not simply a case of, well, on a certain date we do an evaluation. It's an ongoing process. And the idea is that as it goes on, you learn lessons and things that maybe have not been properly aligned or properly set up are then adjusted accordingly on the way forward. Um, so it's important to bear that in mind. All I can say is that uh, the claimants who are involved so far are that category of under 25s with no housing costs or children. And then over the next number of months, that will be expanded as it's rolled forward. Um, but these are questions that really need to be directed to the Department for Work and Pensions. 
They haven't issued any evaluation publicly as yet. Robin Newton. Mr. Newton. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his uh, answers thus far. Uh, could the Minister indicate to us, is it possible that there could be a live pilot programme introduced uh, into Northern Ireland before the Welfare Reform Bill actually receives royal assent? I thank the member for, for this question because it's a particularly pertinent one. The answer to this question is no. The universal credit regulations, not just the legislation but also the regulations, must be in place in Northern Ireland before a pilot could be introduced. Therefore, the continued delay of not having the legislation in place is also limiting the opportunities to fully test the system in Northern Ireland, including the payment flexibilities which I have already secured for Northern Ireland uh, claimants. So um, any opportunity to test in Northern Ireland is utterly impossible until we get to that point. And if we uh, put a timeline on it uh, in terms of moving forward on welfare reform, to do legislation and regulations in Northern Ireland through this assembly and to do it properly will take us the rest of 2014 and right through the year 2015. Um, so that is the time scale. Now, people think that we'll keep it on the long finger and somehow or other after the next election at Westminster there will be a new government in place and all of this will suddenly disappear. They are woefully going to be disappointed, very much disappointed because it's quite clear that whether it be a Tory-led government or whether it be Labour, um, Labour is as much committed to welfare reform as indeed are the Conservatives. Uh, there may be a difference in regard to one particular issue around um, the, the uh, under-occupancy or, or uh, bedroom tax, however you describe it, but the principle of moving forward welfare reform is common to both of the main parties across the water, and they'll be somewhere or other at the heart of the government. Fergal McKinney. Thank, Mr. You, McKinney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and in terms, th and th I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. And in terms of implementation here, can you fully outline uh, planned flexibilities uh, to, uh, given lessons learnt from the pilot scheme in England? Well, the first part of his question I can understand. The second part um, I, I find difficult because um, the rollout across the water, the evaluation is an evaluation of, of um, the, the IT system, the piloting over there, and the evaluation hasn't been made public at the point I was making earlier. So therefore, I find it difficult to deal with that. However, in terms of the um, flexibilities and mitigations, um, there were three initial flexibilities which were dealt with back uh, January, uh, a year ago, January 2013. They were dealt with at that point. Further mitigations, um, which were developed over the next number of months right through to June of last year, and there the matter has largely been parked for reasons that the member and other members in uh, this assembly are, are well aware of. Um, I'm not in a position because to state publicly here in the chamber all of the detail, because there is a, a, an executive paper that is sitting there within the executive at the moment. Um, however, I can say this, it has been pretty well trailed in the newspapers by lots of other people, and whatever has been trailed in the paper, I haven't been out and about denying it, so the member can draw his own conclusions for it. And what I will say once more to reiterate is, I want to make sure that we get the best outcome for Northern Ireland, that welfare reform Northern Ireland style is different in those various ways from how it has been implemented in GB. And I believe that the package of flexibilities and mitigations that I, that I developed last year uh, will be very much to the benefit of the people of Northern Ireland. The danger would be if we put ourselves in a position where we maybe even lose some of these, the danger of losing jobs, the, the potential builders of a billion pounds, all those things should focus minds. Sadly, it hasn't to date. McCarthy. Mr. McCarthy. Question number seven, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister. Um, thank the member for the question. My department doesn't measure the extent um, to which local housing is segregated. My department and the Northern Ireland Housing Executive actively undertake and commission research on an ongoing basis to support a strategic approach to housing in Northern Ireland. The research plan for the 2014-15 year will include an update using the 2011 census data to a study based on the 2001 census findings that focused on residential segregation. 
The member may wish to note that the findings of this research, based on levels of segregation over time, found that levels of segregation increased between 1971 and 1991 and changed little between 1991 and 2001. Mr. First response, rather disappointing to hear the figures that he mentioned, but what does the Minister make of the impact from segregation and uh, your ability to efficiently uh, supply social uh, housing right across Northern Ireland? Well, the delivery of social housing is very much um, determined by the housing executive in drawing up the social housing development program. And that is based on uh, a scheme and a methodology that has been there for many, many years. Uh, and it's based on actual facts uh, and figures. Um, in terms then of the impact of segregation on the actual delivery, um, that's a question that people might well speculate about. What I do know and I'm able to say is that we are moving forward with a number of projects, both in terms of uh, identifying schemes that could be shared schemes, and secondly, looking at um, uh, establishing more uh, thoroughly the, the work that has already been going, ongoing by the executive, uh, housing executive about shared um, locations, and also then looking at mixed tenure developments in the private sector. And one of the things that I did in that regard, and I'm sure the member will endorse it, is this. By taking the, the centre of Belfast and making that a common landlord area, so that it's not identified with one community or the other, but that people from every community could put that down as a common landlord area. That was, I think, a positive initiative that uh, I brought forward to try and uh, ensure that the centre of the city is a shared site, and something I'm sure I see the member nodding, and he indeed does uh, indeed agree with that. So there are things that we can do. What's been taken forward under TBUC will also help. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister? Uh, the Minister, in his first response to Mr. McCarthy, mentioned research. Could I ask the Minister if he could possibly expand upon this, just what that research had to say? Um, the Housing Executive published research on mapping segregation in Northern Ireland in 2009. That research found that, and this was based on the 2001 census, 91% of all Belfast Housing Executive estates were highly polarised. This meant they had more than 80% of one community or less than 20% of one community uh, in an estate. The research also looked at all district councils across Northern Ireland and found that segregation was not uniformly high across council areas, suggesting that the findings for Belfast may not be typical. The figures cover housing executive estates, but include a range of tenure types. For example, in 2001, Belfast housing executive estates consisted of 60% social rented tenants, 34% owner-occupiers, and 5% private rented tenants. And there is no uniformity even around that. There are some estates which have a very low level of um, private ownership or, or, or of owner occupiers, and other housing executive estates where, um, over the years, quite a significant number of the houses have become owner occupiers. Um, so it's a situation that's quite varied from place to place. The Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey for 2012 showed that 70% of people would prefer to live in a mixed religion uh, neighbourhood. Uh, so that's really the information uh, I hope addresses the question. The housing executive is the arbiter of housing need determines where social housing should be built and programme schemes to meet that demand, and that is their responsibility. Housing associations are responsible for the identification of potential development sites for inclusion in the social housing development programme. The housing executive will support building where need is clearly identified and has encouraged housing associations to bring forward proposals for development in the new Belfast city centre common landlord area. A primary aim of the new common landlord area is to promote shared residential development within the commercial, administrative and cultural heart uh, of Belfast. Members, that includes all questions to the Minister. We now, now, now move to topical questions to the Minister. And I call Jim Allister. Mr. Allister. You, Mr. Speaker, given that the Board of the Housing Executive is reported to now have approved a settlement with the four contractors whom the Minister alleged 
had overcharged by £18 million. Pounds. When does the Minister propose to make a statement to the House on the outcome of that matter, and will he make that commitment to make such a statement? Well, first of all, uh, I think that the, the member, I'm disappointed that someone who's a member of the Social Development Committee is not better informed on, on this matter, uh, even though he has been on the committee now for a period of time. The figure that was uh, referred to by the member is a figure that was provided by the Northern Ireland Housing Executive to me. And it's quite clear, you know, Mr. Dalit's level of understanding of a number of issues seems to be rather limited. Um, perhaps if we listen more, he would learn more. But certainly, as regards uh, the, the point that I've just made, I'll reiterate it. The figure was provided to me by the Housing Executive. It was a figure that had been put to their board before I ever saw it. It was the housing executive's own figure. Now, as regards moving forward, I want to see movement forward as soon as possible, um, and uh, I hope that we will get a satisfactory outcome between the housing executive and various contractors as soon as possible, because it's in everyone's interest that that should happen. Uh, and I'm sure that at that point, there will be something to be said to the members of this assembly. Well, having made the false allegation about the 18 million, I think the minister is the last one to talk about being better informed. But will he commit to a public oral statement in this House on the outcome to match the fact that he made the allegation in this by a public oral statement? Will he make that commitment? Um, I think that once again, and maybe Mr. Dallet's not the only person who needs to listen and learn. I think also, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, uh, to accuse another member of a falsehood is a matter that uh, indeed uh, is something that may be considered and reflected on, uh, because I'm sure, as the member is well aware, it may well not be an appropriate statement to make. I've said already that the figure that was given to this assembly was the figure that was given to me by the housing executive. It was a figure that was provided by the housing executive. It was their figure. The member knows that, and I wish the member would reflect on that. Whatever happens moving forward, I would say this, that it's absolutely essential that we do nothing in this chamber or on the floor of this assembly that in any way makes it more difficult for the housing executive to reach agreement uh, with the contractors. Um, I think also the um, full detail of what I actually said at the time, the member might care to reflect on, because sometimes it gets uh, distorted. I wouldn't suggest for a moment that was for party political purposes. I wouldn't suggest that, <laughs> but others might well think it. Mr. Speaker, uh, can I ask the Minister that given that 300 DVLA uh, workers are to lose their jobs, the majority of them in Coleraine, what contribution will he make uh, to fill in the vacuum? Um, I can assure the member of uh, the fact that my department has. Um, staff spread right across Northern Ireland, uh, that our staff are not focused in one particular part of the province. Um, both the Housing Executive and the Social Security Agency have offices in many parts, particularly the Housing Executive. Uh, so the uh, staff who are under um, the um, remit of DSD are indeed widely spread out. Um, I can say that I share the disappointment um, there with the member about that decision to remove those jobs from Northern Ireland. Uh, and I can assure also the member my department is undertaking a programme of reform and modernisation across a range of its responsibilities. The pace and range of the change, not least the need for significant staff redeployment as a consequence of local government reform, means that my department does not have the capacity to transfer a block of work to Coleraine um, as sometimes people might wish for. However, I can offer assurance that my department will work collaboratively with DFP and with other departments to accommodate surplus staff through the operation of the Northern Ireland Civil Service vacancy management process. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister to assure his workers in the DSD crime buildings in Coleraine uh, that their jobs are safe and won't follow uh, the same path as the DVA workers? Um, I would just make two points here. first one is a more general point than this. Um, if welfare reform doesn't move, 
If it is stalled and blocked by some people for, because their parties lack leadership, then indeed we might actually be talking about more job losses in Northern Ireland. Because all of those jobs, and we're talking about a substantial number of jobs, more than 1,500 jobs in Northern Ireland, delivering services to people in regions of Great Britain, those jobs will go. There's no way that the government of Westminster is going to say, well, you've gone it alone. We're taking the pain here in uh, GB as regards implementing welfare reform, and you think you're going to keep those jobs. Anybody who thinks that is living in cloud cuckoo land. And at that point, then some members of this assembly will have to go back to the people who have been thrown out of their jobs because of their incompetence and intransigence, and they will be saying to those staff spread across offices in Northern Ireland, including many up in the North West, they'll be saying to those people, why on earth were you so intransigent? Why were you so uh, fixed in your ways that you couldn't see the reality on the ground? And why did you act in a way that cost us our jobs? That's an answer I wouldn't want to have to give to people who are uh, in those offices. And there will be a lot of them that those people in other parties will have to answer to. Um, the, the, with regards to the Social Security Agency, the agency remains committed to providing frontline services from the Coleraine Jobs and Benefits Offices. And the office will also continue to house the Error Reduction and Information Security Unit. And I just pause with a final statement. I hope that members on the other side of this chamber will reflect on what I have said today about jobs, because I certainly would not want to be the one who goes back and tries to explain to somebody who is put out of a job because of their intransigence. Yeah. Yeah. Sandra Warren. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for his assessment uh, of the biggest challenges which would be faced with the introduction of the under-occupancy under penalty in Northern Ireland? Well, we're into this area again. It's a wee bit grey because there is a paper before the uh, executive uh, in regard to mitigations for welfare reform. But I think it has been widely trailed in the media that there is a significant element in there to address the issue of uh, un under-occupancy or, or bedroom tax, however you, you describe it. Um, one of the things I did when I came into the department was to say to the housing executive, when they first brought forward um, the social housing development program, I put them the question, those who brought it forward and presented to me, did you in drawing this up take account of welfare reform? And the straight answer was no because you didn't see suitable properties in that list. They were still building properties of a larger size and not enough one- and um, two-person two properties. So therefore, we have said to them, and we did at that point very clearly, look, take it back and rework that. And I'm glad to say now we're in a position where there is a higher level of delivery of smaller units in order to prepare for uh, the, the um, potential uh, implementation of, of uh, welfare reform in Northern Ireland. But having said that, there is reportedly uh, a significant element in our measure, in, in the package of mitigations that I have developed, uh, there is a significant provision in there to address the issue of uh, the, the bedroom tax, which obviously does concern the member and other members as well. Sandra Overham. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, I think maybe the Minister could just clarify if he's aware of the pledge by the leader of the Labour Party. And I'll quote, if we win the next election, I will scrap the bedroom tax. No ifs or buts. A one nation Labour government will repeal it. And given that it appears uh, that Northern Ireland is uh, many months away from any bill receiving royal assent, uh, does he still think this is a wise decision, even at this late stage, to bring in a policy which could uh, likely be repealed within a matter of months? Well, the election is not even over a year away. I have to say with respect that I find the question somewhat confusing and contradictory. Let me reiterate it again. First of all, I said earlier in response to an earlier question that it was absolutely clear that the situation in GB will be dependent on which party emerges as the main party after the election. And I said clearly, therefore I am well aware of the position of the Labour Party vis-à-vis -vis, uh, the, the Conservative Party on this issue. However, um, I am not a prophet and I assume the member is not either, and neither of us can predict the outcome of the forthcoming Westminster uh, election next year. It is uh, 13 months or 14 months away, so therefore I think we will have to wait and see uh, in that regard. Um, as regards the um, situation here in Northern Ireland, um, we need to be prepared. And uh, I have said already, time scale for bringing in legislation and regulations will be the end of next year, the end of 2015. And it's therefore incumbent on us to make sure in the meantime that 
If it's the case that you get uh, a government after the next election where this bedroom tax continues thereafter, that we're at least prepared, and that's why I've been preparing a mitigation to deal with that. It's important that we do that. It would be remiss of me if I didn't do so, and uh, I'm sure the member and other members will support the measure that I've brought uh, to the executive, and which I hope will maybe get beyond the executive out into this assembly so that members can discuss and when, in a knowing way and in an informed way see the good package of measures that uh, I and uh, colleagues have developed. Alistair Ross. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In return to the issue of welfare reform, can the Minister advise the House, is he content that the many flexibilities which he gained and secured from the national government are enough to help us mitigate, mitigate against the worst aspects of welfare reform for the most vulnerable in society here in Northern Ireland? Well, I welcome the fact that the, the member in posing that question speaks about the most vulnerable in our society. Because in all of this, that has been my intention, to make sure that those who are vulnerable are protected. We need to have a good welfare system to protect those who are vulnerable because of perhaps illness, because of circumstances, because of unemployment, um, people who would not want to be in that situation but find themselves in that situation. We should have a concern for them. I believe that the package of um, measures that I have um, developed um, and which were presented to the executive demonstrate how we can implement welfare reform here so that we see devolution working for the people of Northern Ireland and protect the most vulnerable. There are some people in this uh, chamber who would actually like to see, and elsewhere, who, uh, well, not that many in the chamber, but one or two, who think it would be a good idea to do away with the Assembly and actually have direct rule. The fact is, if we had direct rule here in Northern Ireland, if we had direct rule, if we had direct rule, sorry, some people, it always seems to be the same individual who isn't able to listen. Yeah, it's, it's always, plenty to say. always a lot to say, but very little substance and also an inability to listen. So, um, returning to the point, if we had direct rule here in Northern Ireland, we would be in a position where welfare reform, Tory style, That's right. That's right. Tory welfare reform would be imposed on Northern Ireland. We're able to deliver a better outcome for the people of Northern Ireland because of devolution, and this is an excellent example of devolution delivering for the people of Northern Ireland and protecting the most vulnerable. I can also say that I've listened to recent comments by church leaders in England about the impact of welfare reform on the most vulnerable. Uh, and I confirm the package of measures I'm presenting will ensure similar issues do not arise here in Northern Ireland. I met the church leaders here recently, the main, four main church leaders, and we had a very good discussion and uh, uh, quite a lot of points in which they were uh, supportive of what we're doing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would congratulate the Minister on the flexibilities that he has secured from the government, and I'm sure we're the envy of, of other regions across the United Kingdom in terms of the, 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 the measures that he has, has, uh, has gained. Can I ask him in terms of those who are still opposing the uh, welfare reform in Northern Ireland and, and bringing the bill back to the Assembly, have they presented the Minister with a set of proposals of their own or any areas in which they want to gain further flexibility? Well, that's an area where it doesn't take long to answer the question, <laughs> because there's been a shortage of ideas coming forward in that regard. People may bluff and bluster, may make grand statements and grab a headline, but the hard work was actually done within the Department of Social Development by myself and my colleagues and my officials, all in there working together to make sure we get a good outcome for Northern Ireland. Um, I haven't heard any of these other things, but the reality is that people who want to bury their head in the sand and behave like an ostrich and hope it will all go away are simply going to burden the people of Northern Ireland if they have their way. They want to burden the people of Northern Ireland with a bill of a billion pounds to be paid back to the Treasury. And if they, some people even think we should develop our own system for Northern Ireland, our own IT system, they'd burden us with a bill of 1.6 billion. So between a billion paid back and a £1.6 billion pounds for uh, developing our own IT system, there won't be much money left in the budget in Northern Ireland for housing, for hospitals, for schools and all the other things that are so dear to our hearts. I would uh, caution them to think very carefully at this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Members, that includes question time.